flute. My name is Trevor Mowry. I play oboe. My name is Joe Morris. I play clarinet. And I'm Drew Thompson, and I play the bassoon. And we are here today to talk to you a little bit about Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov's masterpiece, Scheherazade. This piece is based on a tale from A Thousand and One Nights. There once was a sultan who was convinced that all women were false and faithless. So he vowed to kill each one of his brides on their first nuptial night. But one bride, Scheherazade, was clever enough to entertain the sultan with fascinating tales and stories. And the sultan was so captivated by these stories that he postponed her execution from day to day until he repudiated his bloody vow entirely. Throughout the piece, uh, Rimsky-Korsakov makes use of a lot of themes and motifs to represent different characters in each of the stories. For example, at the very beginning, there's a theme that represents the, the dark and evil sultan. Throughout the first movement, this theme changes. Um, towards the end, uh, Trevor and I both play this theme, but it's a lot lighter and more innocent sounding. So we're going to play that for you. Beyond the motifs that represent different characters, Rimsky-Korsakov also makes use of uh, themes and motifs to represent the stories that each movement tells. For example, the first movement is known as uh, Sinbad's ship, and at letter D, there's a, a woodwind section that represents the rocking move moment of the ocean. Uh. The second movement of this piece, we start out with a violin cadenza, which is reminiscent from the first movement, and this cadenza sort of represents Scheherazade herself, who's setting up each of these stories. After this cadenza, the bassoon gets to introduce the first theme in the second movement, and this theme gets passed around throughout the wind section, and each one of us gets to play it in our own way, as if they're different characters in the story. I play it, but with different musical instructions from the composer. And then lastly, later on he has the entire wind section playing it, and it's very aggressive and abrasive. Korsakov has cadenzas for both the clarinet and the bassoon in a very improvisational and gypsy-like theme, uh, and it gets passed around between the two of us throughout the movement. In the third movement, which is called The Prince and the Princess, um, the flute and the clarinet both have these wonderful flourishes that represent the love story between the prince and the princess. <laughs>
to hear the exciting conclusion to this fantastic tale, and we'll see you in the Riverwalk Center this Wednesday, July 20th at 7.30 p.m. This violin concerto has a very interesting history behind it. Uh, it was commissioned in 1939 by a Philadelphia industrialist by the name of Samuel Fells, and it was commissioned to be written for a violinist by the name of Iso Berselli, um, who had just recently graduated from the Curtis Institute of Music alongside with Barber. Uh, Barber accepted the commission and he went to Switzerland to work on the concerto. He had the first two movements delivered to Iso Berselli by mid-October, and Berselli received them with great enthusiasm. However, Berselli suggested to Barber um, that in writing the third movement, maybe Barber could include a little more of a little more that showcases um, the violinist's technical abilities. And so, Barber, when Barber presented the third movement to Berselli, Berselli was a little disappointed um, because he felt that it lacked in the substance and quality that the first two movements had and that it didn't have a sense of belonging to the entire piece. Um, Priscelli felt that it would not make it into a standard concerto um, repertoire because of the third movement, and he wanted Barber to revise it. However, Barber declined, and so Priscelli um, decided not to premiere the concerto. The concerto was eventually premiered by a Curtis student, uh, Her Herbert Bongnell, and it was under the direction of Fritz Reiner with the Curtis Symphony Orchestra. It was later brought to the attention of Eugene Ormandy, who premiered it with the Philadelphia Orchestra um, with Albert Spalding as, uh, for violin, and um, then it quickly entered the standard violin repertoire, so Priscelli was proved wrong. The beginning melody evokes uh, very images of the rolling hills in Switzerland, which Barber must have drawn inspiration from. Um, the second movement includes a beautiful oboe solo um, that paves the way for the violin entrance and it sets a very serene and calm atmosphere. The last movement is written in a modo perpetuo style and it showcases the violinist's technical abilities.